شیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین الحمد للہ اللذی هدانا لہذا وما کننا لنحتدی لولا ان هدانا اللہ والصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبیاء والسید المرسلین وشفی المذنبین سیدنا ونبینا عبی القاسم محمد اللہم صلی علی محمد وآل محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المذلومين المنتجبين لا سيما مولانا وسيدي صاحب الأسر والزمان روحي وعرواه العالمين له الفداء وأجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف ولعنة دائمة على أعدائهم ومنكر فذائلهم للان إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه كولي for the hastening of the return of our 12th Imam, Imam Al-Hujjah, one salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. My dear brothers and sisters in Iman, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. As we continue in this series for this Muharram, in which we are looking at the commandments for a healthy Islamic life, as we mentioned from night number one that we are going through a passage from chapter number 17, Surat Bani Israel, from verses 23 up until 36. And tonight I want to look at the topic under the heading of Charity Begins at Home. Before I begin with the topic, let me refer to the verse that I want to look at tonight, which is verse number 26 of chapter number 17. Where Allah says the following, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Wa ati dal kurba haqqahu wal miskina wa bna sabili wa la tubadhir tabdhiran. Allah says in this passage, and give to the near of kin, and the needy and the wayfarer their dues, what is owed to them, and do not squander your wealth wastefully. Now we know for a fact that without a doubt in this world that we live in today, we have various levels of categories of individuals. You have some people who we call the haves, and there are the have-nots. There are people whom Allah has blessed with tremendous amount of wealth, not only thousands, not only tens of thousands, but there are people maybe in our community, definitely in this country, who are millionaires, who are billionaires. At the same time that we have people who have so much money they could never ever spend it and in their natural lifetime, you have people who can barely make ends meet, who can't pay their mortgage, who don't know if they'll put food on the table for their children tomorrow. Why do we see this disparity in the world? Why do you see some people with so much and a same God whom we as Muslims claim to be a just God who is fair, why does he apparently deprive other people of a comfortable life? It's a question that I'm sure we've thought about. Today when I was leaving Salatul Jummah and going home from lunch with one of the brothers, a car passed by us, not a normal car, it was a Lamborghini Aventador. And if you know that car, it starts at 300,000 pounds. Now here I am sitting in a car, maybe worth 10,000, and a, a Ventador drives up beside us, and obviously it's an Aventador, so he went very fast. Why would Allah give that individual so much that he can or she could buy a car for 300,000 pounds? It's something that maybe we think about when we see people with palatial mansions, nice cars, yachts that they can cruise the world in. I don't want to give the entire answer away. We looked at it a few nights ago when we looked at the God-centric life, if you'll recall that. Ultimately, we understand that we are all here for an examination. Allah tells us so many times in the Quran. For example, in Surah Al-Ankabut, Allah says, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitani Rajeem Ahasiba Nas and Yutruku and Yakulu Amanna do we as human beings think that we will be left alone saying that we believe and that we will not be examined or tested in this life? So this life is an examination. Everybody is tested in a certain way. Some people have perfect health. They never get sick. That's their examination. Other people, they fall sick. They have this disease. They have that illness. They may have cancer. 
That's their examination. Certain people have more money than they know what to do with. That's a test which we'll see tonight. Other people are penniless. They can't even afford their daily food. That again is an examination from Allah. So tonight I want to try and dissect and look at this topic from the Quranic narrative based on the verse that I began with and the topic of charity more specifically but also try and touch upon why we see this glaring disparity in our societies not only today but this was there probably from time immemorial from the earliest times of human history <coughs> the first thing I want to mention is we live in a selfie generation this word selfie, I'm sure you all have heard of it. We all take selfies, we go to the beach, we take a selfie. We go to Karbala, we take a selfie with Imam Hussein behind us, right? Sometimes it becomes a bit obnoxious and annoying. People are doing tawaf around the Kaaba and they're taking selfies of themselves to show the world that they're doing tawaf. But that's another story. But we live in a selfie generation. This word actually is interesting that Oxford Dictionary rated this the number one word in 2013. It was the most used word five years ago. And you know, before we had smartphones with front-facing cameras, we had very little usage of that term selfie because we didn't have phones where we could be in the picture. Right? We took pictures of others. We cared about other people. We wanted our family to be in the picture. But now that our phones have a camera, Right? Now it's all about me. It's about what I want to do. I want to be in the picture. I, I got to be the focal of life. I was looking at some statistics today, and this is not only for the UK, but it's around the world. But the BBC reported, this is going back about three years ago, that in the United Kingdom, 1% of the population, about half a million, they own over 15% of the wealth of this nation. 1% of the people own 15%. It was like $18 trillion. It was a, a staggering amount. And then in the next sentence, they said that 15% of the population, 7 million or around 7.5 million, have zero. 15% of the British population have zero or they're in debt. They have a negative balance in their life. Now look at that disparity. That's not only here. You go to Canada, you go to America. I'm sure you go to the so-called Muslim countries. You know, they call themselves Muslim countries, but we know how corrupt even those governments are. Many of us fled those countries and we've seen their corruption firsthand. But the fact that there is such a staggering disparity amongst humanity that you can have people who have billions of dollars who literally could not spend that money in their lifetime and then you have a family or a single mother who can't even put food on the table for her child we have to admit that there is something wrong with the societies that we live in again all of the societies religion came to break this Religion came to destroy this imbalance, but unfortunately, who follows religion today? Not here, we don't follow it. Not back home, we don't follow religion. Because if we did, you wouldn't have, as the brother said, so many thousands of orphans in Iraq. You wouldn't have orphans in Afghanistan, in Pakistan. They would be taken care of. But unfortunately, we haven't, as a collective ummah, we haven't fulfilled our responsibilities in addition to corruption at government levels and all of that. But the point is that, that economic disparity is there. And again, as I said in the beginning, that when we see this in our lives today, that guy with the Lamborghini who drove by me, why is it that some people have so much and others have just living hand to mouth, as they say? You know, there's a very beautiful verse of the Quran that really addresses this at one level and Allah talks about in, in, in a very subtle way one of the aspects or one of the angles why there might be this disparity again keep in mind our topic is about charity tonight and about the importance of giving in charity but in chapter number 9 Surah Tawbah 
as you know, the only chapter of the Quran that does not begin with the phrase Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And obviously there's a reason and a rationale why Allah omitted that verse. But in that chapter, verse 55, Allah makes a very interesting comment to us. He says, فَلَا تُعْجِبْكَ أَمْوَالُهُمْ وَلَا أَوْلَادُهُمْ Don't be amazed, don't fall into perplex or bewilderment or amazement when you see their wealth, meaning the, the kuffar or the mushrikeen, the disbelievers. Don't get amazed when you see their vast amounts of wealth or their large families, their children. You know, there was a time, especially in the Arabian Peninsula, at the time of the Prophet, where you were judged by also how many children you could produce. Maybe we don't have that same phenomenon in Western countries, as, as we know the birth rates are declining in so many Western countries, but definitely in some of the third world countries, there's still this baggage, this still, there's still this stigma that if you don't give if a, if a woman doesn't give her husband X amount of boys, if they're only daughters that are born, then there's something wrong with that woman. God forbid that that would be a reality. But that's a back, backwards mentality that some people, even Muslims still have. That their wife, if she doesn't deliver a boy, and they have two, three, four kids, there's something wrong with her. It's, again, a twisted ideology. Islam doesn't condone it. But we pick this up from our tribal mentality. So Allah says, فَلَا تُعْجِبْكَ أَمْوَالُهُمْ وَلَا أَوْلَادُهُمْ And then Allah makes a very poignant statement. إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهِ لِيُؤَذِّبُهُمْ بِهَا فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا That indeed Allah only wants to punish those people with these things in the life of this world. And Allah uses the word azab. Innama yuridu Allah liyuadhibahum biha fil hayat al dunya. Watazhaka anfusuhum wahum kafirun. Allah wants to punish these individuals with excess wealth, with excess children, with this large family. It's a form of punishment, Allah says. It's not a form of fadila, it's not a virtue, it's not a greatness that they have a half a million dollar car that they have a five million pound mansion, that they have their own private jet airplane that they can cruise around the world in. Allah says that you think that this is a, a, a benefit for them? That there is a subtle form of punishment in this. And then Allah says that He will allow them or He will make them depart this world while they are in a state of disbelief, in a state of denial. Now this verse again is very interesting if we sit and think about it because as Muslims, as human beings, we tend to think when we see rich people, we say, man, Allah must really love that person to give them so much. What did I do wrong, right? We tend to think like this and when we see somebody who's just an average, you know, middle class earner, they drive a basic car, they don't have a fancy home, they don't have nice jewelry, if it's on the ladies' side, they don't have a Gucci handbag, they don't have nice expensive shoes for 500, 600, 1,000 pounds. They don't have all of that fancy bling on them. We think, man, Allah must really hate that person, gave them nothing in this world. Actually, as I said on night number two, we need to realign our understanding of Tawheed. And I talked about that God-centricness and religion-centric, and we have to become God-centric to really understand how God works. He doesn't give because you deserve it a lot of times. Sometimes Allah gives just to get you off of His back, so to speak. And sometimes Allah will not give, not because He hates us, but because He wants to continue to hear us call upon Him. You know, on a side note, I was reading about this man from the United Kingdom who won the biggest ever lottery in the UK many years ago. I think he won 18 million pounds in the lottery sweepstakes. And if you've read the story, it's in the local British tabloids. He died a few years back, or very recently, and they chronicled the life that he led. Losing his wife, losing his children to divorce, getting into alcoholism, going into, you know, going into illicit relationships, and ends up being dead, buried in, a, in, a, in an unmarked grave today. 
And you read his story and you think, well, he had 18 million pounds given to him overnight. He must have had the best life ever. But he's dead today in a grave unmarked. He lost his wife, he lost his kids, he lost everything. Where was the happiness in his life? Right? We don't know why he died, we don't know how he lived his life other than what this article will mention. But again, where was the benefit in that man's life? Where was the benefit in anybody's life who has just profane amounts of wealth that they, either they've made in a, in, a, in a permissible way or that they've gotten from illicit gains? We don't know. So Allah says, don't be amazed at these people. This is not something that you should be running after. Now, I don't want it to seem that Islam is against being successful. Right? No, as a community, we should be successful. I tell this to congregants wherever I speak, that I always encourage the young ladies and young men, go to school, get a good education, do well, become professionals, make money, but become professionals with taqwa, with piety, so that when the masjid needs your donations, you don't have to think twice about it. Become professionals who are wealthy, but when the time comes for hajj, you take the time off to go for hajj. Be professionals who are millionaires, but when Sayyid al-Shuhada asks you to come for the ziyara, you don't have to question when or, you know, is it safe to go? You just book your ticket and you go to Karbala. So we have to be professionals, men and women. We have to be at the upper echelons of society. We should be making the money, supporting our centers, building better centers, supporting media as I talked about the other night. Because we need this as a community to progress. We moved to this country, we set up homes here. This is home now. Our children were born here. We're not going back to Africa or India or Pakistan or Iraq. This is home. And if it's home, we have to build it up and we have to take care of one another. Again, charity begins at home. What I want to look at tonight. So sometimes wealth is a curse. And the interesting part of this verse, and I'll move on, is where Allah says, وَتَزْهَكَ أَنفُسَهُمْ وَهُمْ kafirun." This verb Allah uses, وَتَزْهَكَ, this verb zahaka, is interesting because it has a meaning of death, it has a meaning of leaving this world, but it, disin it, it carries a meaning which is a bit deeper than just a regular death. And so actually, commentators of the Qur'an, and if you look at the lexical meaning in the Arabic dictionaries, they say that it means a kind of leaving of this world, but you leave in such a way that you really did not benefit from the dunya. You didn't really get anything out of it. You came, you lived a few days, you had a few good meals, and you left, but you didn't really truly benefit from the life of this world. And believe me, I've seen people in my own life who are millionaires and they were so limited in what they could do because they couldn't leave their business. They couldn't travel freely because of security concerns. That their life really had no purpose. They had the money, they had the, 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 the power, but they can't enjoy it. They have really no purposeful existence on earth. And I've seen people who have, you know, just the basics in life. But they can travel when they save up they can go for ziyara with peace. They don't have to worry about, you know, keeping their business on the side. They just, they go when they need to go for ziyara. They go for hajj. They go on vacation with their family. And so we have to appreciate that wealth is not always a blessing from Allah. It can be a curse. But if we use the wealth in the right way, if we use it in the ways that Allah wants us to use it, then that can become a blessing for us. Salu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. I don't want to make it to seem that Islam is a classless religion, that we don't have, that we have an, you know, an equal distribution of wealth. Because Islam doesn't believe in that sort of a communistic sort of approach where, you know, everybody should be paid equally. The doctor should make the same as the garbage collector, as same as, you know, the, the newspaper delivery or the mailman. No, Allah tells us in the Quran that each of us get what we work for. You and I will only get what we strive for in this world, in material, and in the spiritual. 
So we're not going to be naive and say that, no, we're all at the same economic status. No, Allah again has given some people more. It's a test. How will you deal with your wealth? Some of us don't have that much. It's a test. How will you deal with your level of poverty or whatever level you're at? So realize that this is our doing to an extent, but it's also a blessing if Allah wants to give it to us. I, looked at, I, I mentioned this last night as a reminder where I talked about how a glass like this can only hold so much water. If we're at a spiritual level where I can only deal with making 40,000 pounds a year, God knows what would happen if I got a job that was making 100,000. I might corrupt myself completely. And so until I can expand my, my spiritual heart, until I can allow more of Allah's blessings to flow into me, I need to deal with where I'm at economically. And if I can increase, then Allah will increase. If you are thankful, I will increase you, Allah says. So we have to be at that level of increasing our connectivity to Allah, expanding our hearts, giving in charity as we're going to look at tonight, and we will see that then the blessings will begin to flow back from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. At another level, we see that when I look at charity, and I don't want to only mention the recommended, because we have the different forms of sadaqat, we have also obligatory things like the khums, the 20% on our net savings, which as we know as followers of the Ahlul Bayt salam, is an obligation upon us. It's in the Quran in chapter 8, Surah Al-Anfal, Allah tells us that whatever you gain, that a fifth of that is for Allah, for the Rasul, for the Qurba, Wal Yatama, Wa Masakin, Wa Bna Sabil. Allah tells us khums is an obligation. And sometimes that becomes a bitter pill to swallow. How can Allah, you know, as it is, the government is taking all my VAT and my uh, income tax. Now Allah is going to turn around and say, I want 20% of your money as well. They're like double dipping. Here the government's taking some. And then God is taking some on top of that. What does that leave me with? Right? But, you know, and Khums is a different discussion. Maybe, maybe in one of the latter nights we might touch upon it. But we have to realize that Khums, in the most, for most cases, it helps our communities. If you look at many of our centers in the West, they are funded by Khums. You look at much of the propagation of Islam that we do, the media, the, the, the satellite TV, the books that are being published. Um, you know, all of these things, much of it is, is being funded by homes. So the money that we are paying towards homes to Allah, to the messenger, to the Imam, actually comes back and it develops our societies here. So don't just think that homes is going overseas and we don't see the benefit of it. No, we see the benefits of it. And if we don't see it, then we need to talk to our institutions and get some clarity of how those funds are being utilized. Again, that's a different topic. I don't want to go into that. But Allah, again, in the Quran, again, and I want to keep re bringing up these ayat because Allah gives us answers for a lot of our dilemmas that we face in the world today. When it comes to wealth distribution, as I said, 1% of the British, of the UK population, 15% of the wealth, 15% have zero. Allah looked at this in the Quran and He mentions a very interesting concept in chapter 59, Surah Al Hashr. Verse number seven, it's a, a small portion of the verse where Allah talks about why He implemented acts of charity, of the sadaqat, of zakat, of giving to the less fortunate. And He says, la yakuna dawlatan bain al minkum. He says that the reason why these were legislated is so that the wealth does not just transfer between the rich people of society. Right? So it doesn't just you know, um, rotate around the rich people. Right? A millionaire goes and he buys a car and he spends his money in a lavish restaurant. So that dealership that sells the car, they're already well off. So the rich are making the richer even more richer. Right? Allah says that He wanted to bring an end to that through a lot of these acts of charity so that that wealth could break through that cycle of just being going around the rich people 
and other people in the society could benefit from that a little bit. And so when you look at it, Islam actually implemented acts of charity at every juncture of our life. Look at the month of Ramadan. If a person, a man or a woman, if you intentionally break a fast, not that you're traveling and you can't fast, not that you're sick, you can't fast, not that you're elderly, you're on meds and you can't fast, but you as a healthy man or woman, you just say, I don't care about this fasting, I'm going to break my fast and, and eat something. There is a penalty, a kafara we have to pay, right? If you do it with something halal, you have an option, either you free a slave, doesn't really exist today, you um, have to feed 60 people and there's uh, 750 grams of food, or you give the equivalent in money, or you fast for 60 days straight, 30 days consecutively, and then you can break up the other 30 days. But let's just say you can't do them and you want to, and you want to pay 60 people. So if you broke your fast with something permissible, you're going to be paying about $40. Sorry, let me go back. If you break your fast intentionally, so you knew you had to fast, it was wajib, you said, I don't care, I'm going to break my fast. For every day that you broke a fast intentionally, 80 pounds you have to pay. If you, if you can't you know, um, free the slave, if you can't fast the 60 days. So you do the math, 80 pounds for one day, 30 days in Ramadan, 2,400 pounds. That's, that's a lot of money, right? But the, and it goes to the needy people. So the point was, keep the needy people, give them some support, right? If you don't want to voluntarily help them, Allah is saying, what? I'm going to make you pay. Because who wants to fast 60 days straight, really? And if you broke, if you didn't fast for 30 straight days, 30 times 60 is what, 1800 days? You're going to fast straight if you didn't keep an entire fast of Ramadan. So that's a difficult thing to think about. Now obviously Allah is merciful and He says if you can't do it, you have to do istighfar, ask forgiveness. But if you get to a point in your life where sometime down the line you can do one of those, then you have to do them. But what if you have to break a fast, you're elderly or you can't keep a fast? You're sick, you're old, you're, um, you, you're a, a, a mother who's pregnant, you're nursing your child, you can't keep a fast because you won't be able to um, feed your child, let's say, to nurse your child. It's a bit easier, you pay the fidya, it's not a penalty, it's just a recompense and for 30 days, it's only about 40 pounds if you do that in this country. You can send it overseas so it's cheaper, but if you were to give that money here to a family, somebody who's poor, 40 pounds for the entire month. But the point of the matter is, is that Allah wanted to make sure that our wealth doesn't remain stagnant. It goes in circles in the community, that we look for the beggars, we look for the poor, we look for the needy, and we reach out and we give them. And there's other ways, for example, we know that when we have a newborn in our family, a child is born, we do the walima, we shave the hair of the child, and according to the sunnah of Rasulullah, he would weigh the hair and give that amount in silver and charity to the poor people. Again, we see that there's always this constant repetition in Islam, a given charity, given charity. If you have a penalty to make to God, given charity. Something happy in your life comes, a child is born, given charity. You go for hajj, you come back, feed the community, given charity. There's always this constant appeal by Allah that give and help the less fortunate people of the society. However, we have to face the realities is that it's difficult. It's difficult for you and I to part with our wealth. We might come and give our hour or two at the center and volunteer. It's pretty easy to volunteer. But if somebody says, I need some money for a project, as we heard the announcement, as the uh, brother also mentioned for the Muharram program, then it becomes sometimes for some people a bit more challenging to give out of their money. And that's the word we use, isn't it? We say it's my money. I worked hard for this money. I earned it. I went to school. I got an education. I got this good paying career. It's my money. Why should I give my money to somebody else? 
Again, we need to go back to that God-centric lifestyle and think that the money that you and I have in our pocket right now is not my money, it's God's money. And the Quran is clear about this. Allah speaks about this so many times. I'll just give you one verse from Surah Al-Munafiqun, the chapter of the hypocrites. And it's a very interesting verse. Allah says the following. He says, وَأَنْفِكُوا مِمَّا رَزَكَنَاكُمْ and spend, do the act of infaq from that which we have given to you. Allah didn't say and spend out of the wealth that you own because the true Malik, the true owner of this universe is Allah. We own nothing in reality. Everything we own belongs to our master, Allah. The money that we have is Allah's, the home that we have is Allah's. Our children are not ours, they're an amanat, they're a trust Allah gave us. Allah says, I'm giving you a son, I'm giving you a daughter. I might give, it to you, I might give you that child for 20 years, maybe he'll die. Maybe 50 years, maybe 6 months and the child will die. But at the end of the day, Allah says that, that child is not your property. Your name might be there, this is my daughter, this is my son, they have my last name. But ultimately, they're a servant of Allah, they belong to Allah. If we look at wealth like that, Allah says, وَأَنْفِكُوا مِمَّا رَزَكَنَاكُمْ And then He says, مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ يَأْتِيَ أَحَدَكُمُ الْمَوْتِ That spend out of that which we have given you in charity before death comes to one of you. Because what happens at death? We know that when we die, all of the money that we had, our bank accounts, our investments, our homes, our cars, our jewelry, all of that goes to those people who will inherit the wealth after us. Our spouse will take a percentage, our children will take some of it, the government will take their inheritance tax if you have that here in the UK. Then everybody will take their share and you're going to be dead but there is, if you haven't done any goodness, there's not much that's going to be left for you. So Allah says, give in charity before death comes to you. For yakula Rabbi, لَوْلَا أَخَرْتَنِي إِلَىٰ عَجْلٍ كَرِيبٍ فَأَسَدَّقَ وَأَقُمْ مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ Because Allah says when death comes to you, you're going to scream, Ya Allah, let me go back to the dunya so I can give a bit of charity, so I can be of the righteous people, I can be of the salihin. But as Allah says in the verse that follows up, Allah says, وَلَيُّ أَخِرَ اللَّهُ نَفْسًا إِذَا جَاءَ أَجَلُهَا that Allah will never allow you or I to come back to this world. Once our death is written, that's all she wrote. You can come back. You know, not many people have those NDEs, near-death experience. Not many people go and come back again. There's only very few people. If at all, it's a reality. I don't know. But the point is, is that once you die, that's it. There is no more you can do. Charity is done. Good actions are done, praying is done, fasting is done. So Allah reminds us, give in charity while you're alive. We don't know who's going to die when. I remember back home in Canada, in the month of Ramadan about eight years ago, a young brother in our community, 20, 21 year old, drove a motorbike. He would come to the center, the Husseiniya, every night in the month of Ramadan, volunteered, he served the people, he cleaned up after the program. One night, it was the first weekend of the month of Ramadan, his family went to a center in Toronto, he came to our center in the other city, that, in the city that I live in, had the iftar, he prayed, he read the dua iftata, and he was on his motorbike on the way home. He didn't make it home that night. He got hit by a car, we don't know, he landed up in the ditch. His body was in the ditch for three hours until somebody drove by and saw a motorbike on the side of the road and found his completely mangled up body in the ditch. He didn't make it that night. A young man in his early 20s. We don't know when we're gonna die, right? He didn't know he was gonna die on that night. We don't know. And so when Allah says, وَأَنْفِكُوا Give in charity before death comes to you. We have to take that seriously, right? And I, I like to tell my congregants, the community, that diversify your donations. You know, just like when we invest, if you guys are investing and in the stock market or whatever, 
You won't put all of your money into one fund. You'll put some here, some there. You'll diversify your investment just in case you lose money somewhere. Somewhere else you can make, over, make up for it. When it comes to donations and charity, we should try to use a similar philosophy. The orphanage needs money. Give them some of your money. The center needs money for Muharram. Give some of your money to them. Somebody else might come tomorrow and say, we're doing a project you know, to, I don't know, do something. Can you, can you help us out a bit? So rather than giving everything to one cause, inshallah, Allah will give barakah and reward in everything. But why not help everybody out as much as we can? Diversify our donations and gain the maximum reward from every single project that is happening out there. Help the orphans of Iraq. But then help the orphans of London. You know, build a Husseiniya back home in Pakistan. But then build a Husseiniya here in London for the local people. Right? Do everything everywhere as much as we can. Make sure that we can spread our wealth as far as it will reach. Salu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. People will say, well, how much should I give? Should I give all of my money away? Of course not, that would be foolish. Should I just give a few pounds? Ultimately, each and every one of us in this room, we have to ask ourselves, that how much can I afford to give? I don't want to bankrupt myself and give everything. And after this verse actually that I mentioned, actually two verses later, Allah tells us, he says that don't, he, and Allah gives a parable. He says, don't put your neck or your hand onto your neck and give nothing. Nor should you stretch your hand out fully and give everything away in charity. Because he says, then you will be left to pick up the pieces, proverbially speaking. So we have to look at our own lives and what can we afford to give? You know, Amir al-Mu'mineen, the commander of the faithful, Imam Ali, may God's peace and blessings be upon him. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. He has a tradition and if I paraphrase it correctly, he basically says that don't be ashamed of how little you can give. Because it's better to give a little than to give nothing at all. Right? Don't be ashamed that I only have two pounds in my pocket or I only have ten pounds and I see people put a twenty or a fifty in there. What, what will it look like if I put a one pound coin in it? Imam Ali says, don't look at the amount, don't be ashamed at giving a little bit because it's better to give a little than give nothing at all, right? It's better to give a pound, even if every person in this room, let's say, gave five pounds. If we have a hundred people, that's five hundred pounds, right? But if, somebody, if everybody says, well, I only have five pounds, I'll wait till I get a bit more money, then you'll be left with zero in terms of the collection tray. So even if you have a little, don't be ashamed. Right? Allah doesn't look at the, quanti the quantity. Right? He looks at the quality of our actions. When Allah tells us in Surah Al-Mulk about our creation, where He says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Tabarak al biyadihi al-Mulk, wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir. He then says, al khalaq al mauta wal hayat, liyabluwakum ayyukum ahsanu amalan. He created death and life so that he may test us which of us is best in conduct. He said, Ahsanu amala, not akhtharu amalan. Not how much money I can give, not how much prayers I can do, not how much I can beat my chest in Muharram. What quality is it? Right? What is my intention? Innamal a'malu bin niyat. It's all about your intention. If you can only afford one pound, you're a six year old kid, that's all you have. Give that one pound, right? If that's all you had and you gave a pound, you've given 100% of your wealth away. But if you've got a million pounds in the bank and you come with a 10 pound donation, you do the math, that's not even 1% of your wealth. So the child that gave 100% of his wealth, although it was one pound, he gave 100% of his wealth away in charity. So it's not about the amount in dollar or pounds, it's the quality, right? Look at that. Don't look at how much we have to give in charity. Allah tells us again that, and we have the story that I'll, let me share with you at the time of Rasulullah. The prophets in Medina, you know, the community weren't all well off. There were some that were well off, some that were poor. You had people at different, you know, levels of economic status. 
There was a particular Sahabi, a particular noble companion of the Prophet, very rich man. The name escapes me at the moment. But a very rich man has a wife, a couple of children, and he passes away. The wife asked Rasulullah, O Messenger of God, can you come and bury my husband? And what greater honor could there be than the Messenger of God to read your janazah prayer, to put your body in the ground? He obliges, he says, of course I'll come, he's a companion, he was a beloved friend of the community, I'll come and, and, and pray over him. So the Prophet buries him, the, you know, the, 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 the funeral is over, they go back on their own. A few weeks or a few months later, the Messenger of God sees the, men, the man's children, his, 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 his boys, and they're running around the streets of Medina, their hair isn't combed, their clothes are all ripped and tattered, right? it looks like they haven't eaten for days, and he's confused, he's like, this father, when he was alive, he was a rich man, what happened to the wealth? Right? Did the wife just take it away and run away, you know, she got married and, and took all the wealth and left the kids alone? So the messenger of God, he went to inquire that, you know, what happened? Went to the wife, the widow, and said that your husband passed away, he was a rich man. Why are your children in this abject state of poverty? And she told the messenger of God, she says that, you know, before he died, he willed or he gave away all of his money in charity, everything. Didn't keep a single dirham or dinar for the family. He felt he was religious. Right? It was a religious-centric life. He didn't have a God-centric life. He read a verse, maybe given charity, and he gave everything away. And the messenger of God was sad. And he said, he said, if I had known this before I buried him, I wouldn't have prayed the janazah prayer over that man. He gave in charity, fine, but he didn't take care of his family. Right? Like I said at the beginning, charity begins at home. You can't be taking on the world and conquering the world in your own family. They can't take care of their own. Right? They, they don't have money to pay the bills. Right? They don't have the, the money to even enjoy the basic uh, enjoyments of life. And we have a hadith about this that I want to share with us that comes from the man that we're commemorating, Imam Hussein alayhi salatu was salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad where he quotes his grandfather Rasulullah as saying the following statement. He says, Ibda' biman ta'ulu ummaka wa abaka wa ukhtaka wa akhak, thumma adnaka fa adnaak. And then he says, la sadaqata wa dhu rahimin muhtaj. Right? He says that begin by giving charity to your family, to your mother, Again, the mother is first, as we talked about on that night when I talked about parents. It's always about our mother, respect of the mother. Rasulullah says when you want to give money, if, you get, if you're a young man or a young woman, you have a good paying job, your mom and dad won't necessarily come and ask you for money. They might, might not need it. And even if they do need it, they won't come and ask. It's our job as their children to say, Mom, here's money. I just got my first paycheck. Here you go, take the whole thing, mom. Or you see your dad, you know, he has, doesn't drive a nice car. Maybe his smartphone, the screen is broken, and you have a nice shiny new whatever you use. Go and buy him something new. Take care of your mother first. Then he says your father, then your sister, and then your brother. And then he says, after that, those who are closest in relation to you and who are needy. And then he says, as the hadith says, that there is no sadaqah, there is no true charity that you give outside. If your own family, your rahim, the one who are the, 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 the womb, who share the same womb as you, if they're needy, why are you going outside of your community to help other people? Your mother is suffering. Your father, maybe he's retired or he's at that age of retirement and he has to work to pay the bills. Take care of them before you give money back home to your country or to help a cause which might be noble. But if your family is suffering, if your mom and dad can't take care of themselves, look at them first. If your brother is unemployed, if your sister can't get married, she can't afford it maybe, or there's some other challenges, we gotta be take care of our family. It, family comes first. Yes, we have the hadith from Lady Fatima alayhi salam 
that, you know, ajar thumma dar, the neighbors and then the family. But that was in terms of dua, in terms of praying. But when it comes to taking care, it comes back to the family to help first and foremost. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Let me conclude with one last hadith about what kind of wealth should I give? So I talked about how much to give, who to give, what kind of wealth? Meaning that if I have a haram income, you know, if I work at a nightclub, should I be giving that money in charity to the mosque or to my family? If I have a corner shop and I sell alcohol, which is haram as we know to sell, whether to Muslims or not, Am I giving that money in charity? If I won the lottery the other day, am I allowed to give that money in charity? Because some people ask me, I bought the lotto and I won a million, two million, five million. Can I purify the money by giving some of it to the mosque? Sheikh, I'll give you a million, just halal this money for me, you know? No, I'm sorry, it doesn't work like that. As much as I would like a million, maybe, it doesn't work like that. It's not, you know, you can't just, Halal money launder your money and, and, and make it halal by giving in charity. It's not that easy, right? Allah doesn't need our money, right? Allah doesn't need it. We need it. But we have to make sure that we earn our income from halal sources. So yes, just a while ago I told our youth to go and become professionals. But let me mention to you before you become a professional that ask your local scholars, that I want to go into this particular field. Is this a halal profession I should go into? Should I be doing this particular job? I might be involved in something haram. I had a friend in Canada, him and his wife are graphic designers, they're artists. They do amazing work. But then they got a contract to design a, a series of billboards for a lingerie company. What do you do, right? You're a graphic designer, but now you've got this client that came to you, paying very good, I'm sure. Or what if your client is a, a company that deals in alcohol and you have to design some billboards for, you know, a brand of beer? Is it allowed to do it? So we need to make sure before we go into the path of taking a career, we ask our scholars, ask our marja, I want to go into this field and this will be my profession, is this something that Islam would condone? Would my income be considered as a legitimate income? Would I have to worry that I'm feeding my wife or my husband or my children food which may have come from an illicit source? So keep that in mind before you become professionals that you make sure that your education, what career path, what educational path you want to go will lead you down a path of felicity of success and that you'll be doing something that is in line with what our religion asks us to do. So the hadith says the following, I'll end with this. It's a very beautiful hadith. It says, Inna al-haram la yanma. That indeed the wealth that you have gained illicitly and that you're now spending or you're investing, it won't grow. You won't get any benefit from it. Now you might say, I could take my million pounds and put it in the bank and get, let's say, a 3% return rate. I'm going to get growth on that. I'm going to get a capital gain. I'm going to make money. The hadith says, la yanma. It's not going to grow. So either the hadith is wrong or our perspective is wrong. And I tend to side on the fact that the hadith are correct because they're from the imams. So the imam says, inna al-haram la yanma wa inna ma la yubarak lahu fi. Even if you invest the haram money and you get a return, you get a capital gain, there'll be no barakat in it, right? Barakat is a completely different topic. How do you attract barakat? How do you lose barakat? What does barakat mean? It's basically a, a divine gift from Allah. It's where you have an amount of money or amount of time, like all of us have, but you can find that your day is more productive. So sometimes you'll say, I had a very productive day at work today. I had a very productive day at school. That productivity, I would define as barakah. You did something good and Allah is saying that your eight hours, I'm gonna give you the barakah as if you had 18 hours that you'd worked in, but you only worked eight hours. 
Money is the same. If you have barakah in your money, you could work a minimum wage job. But you will see that that money that you make, that small amount, will go much further than your friend who's maybe making a six-figure income. And he's complaining that he can't pay his bills. He may not have barakah in his wealth. So the Imam says, even if you will get a capital gain, you will get profit, it won't have barakat. And then he says, And if you were to give that money in charity, you won't get any return, or any reward for it. Because you can't use haram to get benefit. You know, it's like, it's like Robin Hood. Steal from the rich and give to the poor, right? Islam doesn't condone that. Right? We have that story at the time of the sixth Imam where that guy who would go in the bazaar, in the, in, 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 the, in the marketplace, he would steal some bread from here, steal some pomegranates over there, steal two or three things and give it out in charity. And the Imam saw him and he's like, what are you doing? And the man thought he's a bit smart, right? He wanted to try to be holier than the Pope, as we say. Although the popes aren't even holy nowadays, but <laughs> that's a different story. He says, look, Imam, Allah says, for every sin I do, I get one bad mark on my record. But for every good deed, Allah will give me 10 rewards. So I did three sins. I stole some bread, I stole some pomegranates, but I gave it in charity. So I did three sins. I get 10 rewards for giving it in charity. So I got 30 good deeds minus three, 27. I'm in a net sum of, of being ahead. And the Imam's like, think about it, man. You can't steal something that's not yours. Give it in charity and expect Allah to reward you. So haram is the same. If it's not our right, if you've gotten it from a haram way, from gambling, from casinos, from indulging in alcohol sales and any of the illicit, and now you expect to come and give it to the masjid, they don't, they don't know where the money came from. They might take it if they don't know. But on the day of judgment, you'll look at your account with Allah and you'll have no rewards. Because the Imam says there's no ajr, there's no reward for that. وَمَا خَلَّفَهُ كَانَ زَادَهُ إِلَى النَّارِ And if you die and you leave that money for your inheritors, your wife takes it, your husband takes it, your children take it, you're not going to get any barakah any, or any rewards. Actually, it's your ticket to the fire of hell. It's your ticket to the hellfire. If you have illicit wealth and your children inherit it after you, it's only going to increase in your problems in the hellfire. And so to conclude, we have to be careful that charity, as I said, begins at home. It's great to support causes around the world. It's great to help you know, people in other nations who are impoverished. But if your family are not doing well, look to them first. Make sure your mother is taken care of. Make sure your father is okay. Make sure if your brother, your blood brother doesn't have a job that you're supporting him. If your sister can't get married or she can't pay her university tuition, help her out first. Look to your uncles, your aunts, your cousins. And then if you find that your family is taken care of, they're okay, then look outside. But until and unless we make sure our families are secure, we're not in a position to go and help other people. We're not in a position to help others because we ourselves need to be in that position of being self-sufficient before we can help other people. Salu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And tonight as we continue in these nights of Muharram, let me for the last few more minutes and I'll conclude to talk about one of those men who took care of his family before he went to take care of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Because I'm sure if he had not gotten the blessings of his family, Imam would not have wanted him that day on the plains of Ashura. And I'm talking about that old 70, 80 year old companion, Habib ibn Madahir. Habib, as you know, if you've read the books of history, although historians differ, but he was with the Imams from the early days. He saw Rasulullah according to some of the narrations. He lived with Amir al-Mu'mineen. He saw Imam Hassan when he was a child. He saw Imam Hussein. He was there at the time of Imam Zain al-Abidin. He saw the fifth Imam. And he was one of those young, one of those men rather, not young, young at heart. He was one of those men who left his family to go and help his master Abu Abdullah alayhi salam. 
The books of Maktal mention, and I'll keep it brief tonight, that when he was in Kufa, after Imam Hussein had reached Karbala, and Habib found out because an emissary came with a letter at his door one night. And as you know, Kufa was on lockdown. Ibn Ziyad had his soldiers scouring the city for anybody trying to enter or leave Kufa. But somehow, one of the messengers of Sayyid al-Shuhada was able to get a letter from Sayyid al-Shuhada to Habib. And Imam Hussein basically wrote this letter that, Habib, where are you? We're waiting for you in Karbala. Abu Abdullah had many alams, many flags that he had kept. Abu Fadl Abbas, as we know, was a standard bearer. But there was one flag that was being kept. And when the companions would ask Abu Abdullah that, who is that one flag for? Can I have it? He would say, no, I'm waiting for somebody to come. He's going to be joining us shortly. Don't worry about it. And so when Habib got that letter in the middle of the night, and he read that letter from his master, Sayyid al-Shuhada, his wife asked him, he, she says, Habib, what is it? You look like you're a changed man. And he tells his wife that, my master Hussein has written me a letter. This is the situation he's in. He wants me to come and join him. But I don't know if I should go. Some historians say he was testing his wife to see was she also committed? Was she living that God-centric life? Was she willing to let her husband go and give his life for the master? And so they had this discussion back and forth. He was saying, maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't. She said, Habib, what are you saying? This is Hussein, your master. You've known him since he was a young child. And now in his darkest hour, you're going to turn your back on him? Eventually he says that I'm testing it. I want to see what your reaction would be. He tells his servant, he tells his wife that I'm going to leave to join Hussein on this caravan. And I know I'm not going to come back. But he had the love and the blessings of his wife. She was ready and devoted, giving to the Ahlul Bayt alayhum as -salam. So we're, we're told that the, the books of history mention that Habib tells his servant, get my horse ready and keep it on the outskirts of Kufa. I'm going to join you, but if I can't make it there, he tells his servant. He says, I free you in the, word, in the name of Allah and you do whatever you want to do. As Habib is able to leave the house in the darkness of the night, even though the soldiers are patrolling Kufa, he makes it to the horse and he tells his servant, he says, I have freed you for the sake of Allah. You are free to go as you wish. The servant tells to Habib, he says, Yo Habib, he says, Oh my master. He says, How can I see you going towards Sayyid al-Shuhada, towards Imam al Hussein? Like, how can I see you going towards Jannah, towards paradise, and you want me to go, to go towards the fire of hell? He says, That's not possible, oh my master. Eventually, they begin to go towards Abu Abdullah. They use the darkness of night as a cover and they get to Imam Hussein. Brothers and sisters, this is a few days before the day of Ashura. Some historians say the 7th or 8th of Muharram, or maybe the 9th of Muharram, he reaches Abu Abdullah. As he approaches on his horse, Imam Hussein sees that this man is coming from a distance. They see that dirt is being kicked up in the plains of Karbala. One of the members of Banu Hashim goes to Imam Hussein. They say that somebody's coming. And I'm sure Imam Hussein knew that this was the, the, the longtime friend Habib. As Habib becomes closer and closer, Imam Hussein sees his old, his old friend and he welcomes him into the camp. He says, Habib, where have you been? Oh my Habib, oh my beloved, we've been waiting for you. Here is your flag. This has been waiting for you to come and take this flag for, the, for this supreme battle that will take place. Habib and Imam Hussein engage in a conversation. At one point, the ladies in the tents, Lady Zainab salam, she hears a commotion. She asks Ali al-Akbar, she says, what's happening outside? He comes and he says that there's somebody who's come to help Imam Hussein. She's told that this is Habib ibn Madahir. Lady Zainab is quoted as saying, go to our uncle Habib and tell him salam that we have conveyed our salams. As Ali al-Akbar goes towards Habib ibn Madahir, he tells Habib, he says, oh my dear uncle, he says that Lady Zainab and the women and the children conveyed their salams to you, oh our uncle. Habib begins to break down, he says that who, is, who am I? How is, a, how is a man like me, Habib, that, 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 that the daughter of Amir al-Mu'mineen is giving her salams, her respects to a man like me? Habib asks his Mawla, Imam Hussein, he says, Oh my Mawla, do you permit me to go to the tent of the women to pay my respects to them? 
Imam Hussein says, yes, go by, by all means, go and pay your respects to the ladies. Habib goes near to the tent. Habib addresses the ladies. He conveys his salams to them. He conveys his regards to the women and the children. Lady Zainab and the women respond to his greetings. They're elated that the man has, that his, this man has come to support them. 